Revelation chapter number 13. Again, last week, we talked about the beginning half of this chapter, referring to the Antichrist, all the manner of power that he will be able to yield. We saw where his power came from, which was the dragon, also known as Satan. And then we ended last week in verse number 9. It says, If any man have an ear, let him hear. That's still true for the second half of the chapter, just as much as it is for the beginning half of the chapter. Verse number 10, it says, He that leadeth into captivity shall go into captivity. He that killeth with the sword must be killed with the sword. Here is the patience and the faith of the saints. And I beheld another beast coming up out of the earth, and he had two horns like a lamb, and he spake as a dragon. And he exerciseth all the power of the first beast before him, and causes the earth and them which dwell therein to worship the first beast, whose deadly wound was healed. And he doth great wonders, so that he maketh fire come down from heaven and the, on the earth in the sight of men, and deceiveth them that dwell on the earth by the means of those miracles which he had power to do in the sight of the beast saying to them that dwell on the earth that they should make an image to the beast which had the wound by a sword and did live. And he had power to give life unto the image of the beast. And the image of the beast should both speak and cause that as many as would not worship the image of the beast should be killed. And he caused it all, both small and great, rich and poor, free and bond, to receive a mark in their right hand or in their foreheads, and that no man might buy or sell, save he that had the mark, or the name of the beast, or the number of his name. Here is wisdom. Let him that hath understanding count the number of the beast, for it is the number of a man. And his number is six hundred, three score, and six. Right smack dab in the middle of this chapter. There's 18 verses. Verse number 9. God inspired the Apostle John to write, If any man have an ear, let him hear. It doesn't say that those that have working ears. It doesn't say if you used to have ears. Right? It doesn't say that if you have ears that don't require hearing aids. Right? The qualification for you to be in this group is if you had one. Right? I do believe that we're all born with them. And then it says, if you have an ear, let him hear. Right? Biblically, that definition here, nowadays we think hearing, right, is you can, your eardrums can sense the vibrations in the air and then translate that to your brain into sound. Right? That is one definition of the word here. But in context, what it's saying is let him receive and let him comprehend. Let him meditate upon it. Right? Let him apply what has been said, what is about ready to be said, to his life. In other words, if you have an ear, who's that? That's everybody. It didn't say listen, it said hear. We all know that there's a difference. But I'm not going to pick on anybody individual. But there's a whole bunch of married men that can tell you that they listened, but they didn't hear what was said. Right? They understood the words that were coming out of their mouth. They didn't put the pieces together and understand why it was so important. Right? We can all relate to classroom days where you remember the teacher saying it, but you don't remember hearing it. Right? In one ear and out the other. So who's the qualification? He's saying, let every man hear. Understand what has been said, what's getting ready to come. And then before it gets to the second beast, which we're going to get hopefully get through today, verse number 10, it says, He that leadeth into captivity shall go into captivity. He that killeth with the sword must be killed with the sword. Here is the patience and the faith of the saints. Now, I don't know about you. Those are two odd verses. But smack dab in the middle of the description between the Antichrist and then the second beast, which often referred to the prophet. Then two weird verses. But in truth, those two verses 
are very similar to other passages all throughout the Bible. You've heard it said this way, Be not deceived, God is not mocked. Whatsoever a man soweth, that shall he also reap. Jesus taught that with whatever measure a man judged others, he would be measured by that same stick. But whatever judgment or whatever measure you meet shall return unto you. Since the beginning, all the way down in the garden, there was one rule. You know what that was? Do what God has made you for. Right? Live in the will of God. And don't touch the fruit of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. Right? It was obey God. But if really, you, we were to zoom out a little bit, you know what he taught them? Do good and good will happen, but do evil and evil will happen. Your actions do have consequences. Here the Apostle John is reminding you. Because who is the book of Revelation written to? Well, the beginning portion, there were seven literal letters that he penned to seven literal New Testament churches. But then the rest was also penned, not just for saved folk, but for lost folk. The revelation or the revealing of that mystery that God had kept secret until he revealed it unto John, of things that were to come. And right in the middle of talking about two of the baddest dudes that will ever walk the face of the earth outside of Lucifer, the most evil, the most heinous, the most blasphemous, deceitful, sinful, wicked things, they put right in between those two descriptions, if you have an ear, here. What are we to hear? Yes, we're to hear about the events of the end times. But, it says, He that leadeth into captivity shall go into captivity. You can study the history of man. You know what man's history is? It's just a bunch of cycles. They put new names and they make it sound real fanciful on all these new programs that they're trying to come out with or self-help books. You know, used to it was just called Chicken Soup for the Soul. Right? You all remember them books? Yeah, now they're just teaching the same thing. Well, before that, it was a whole bunch of humanism, which was in them books. Then nowadays they just rebrand it, repackage it, put it down in another book. Although nowadays it's probably in an a e-book or an audio book, and they get somebody real famous who has a nice voice to read it. You know what all of it is? It's just the ideology of man over and over again. Y'all ever study math and realize how old the math that you use every day really is? Right? They can come up with new ways of adding things. It's still the same numbers and you're still putting them together or taking them apart. Right? Like math is the reason that your watch has 12 hours on it. Right? It's the reason that there's 24 time zones around the world every day. They did the math and they figured out how long it takes the sun to make one travel through the sky and then come back up where it started and do it again. And then through math and then by determining how far away they were from the sun and everything else, they did all the division. And they said, you know what? A year is 365.25 days. Not a round number, but close. Right, and if we were to break that down into equal, then we can get something similar to a calendar. But some of them are going to have one more day, some of them are going to have one less day, and in February it's just going to be messed up. Right, that's man's logic. Man reasoned that out. We are fearfully and wonderfully made. The Bible does say that as a man thinketh, so is he. Your brain's a whole lot stronger than you think it is. But it says, he that leads into captivity will be led into captivity. It doesn't say, might go into captivity. It doesn't say, most of them will go into captivity. No, it says, he that leadeth shall be led into captivity. That's a promise. 
It says, he that killeth with the sword must be killed with the sword. Now keep in mind, those are promises in regard to the end time period. Right? There's many a people today that literally they get away with murder. Right? They call it something else. Why? Because that's the logic of man. But they can get away with it. Right? Is this verse saying that God's going to strike them down with a sword out of the sky? No, this is talking about in the end times. You remember that lady that we was talking about in the wilderness? Okay, the Jews. You remember all those people when we were talking about them seals, those that died the death of a martyr because they would not stand in line with the Antichrist crowd? The people that killed them are going to die in the same manner. They were put to death by the sword. You know what that means with violence? They were torn asunder. What do you think they did before they killed them? Or what they're going to do? They're going to hurt them up. They're going to lead them into captivity. They're going to make them into others. They're not a part of us. They're not human anymore. Right? They're worse than you. They're below humankind. No better than to be exterminated. The promise in these two verses is that just because God has allowed it to happen does not mean that God is not keeping a record. And even though for seven years the devil and his crowd are going to have free reign, it does not mean that those that commit heinous acts, does not mean those that led them to commit, or commit those heinous acts are going to escape God's judgment. Because look at the end of the verse. Here is the patience and the faith of the saints. You know what your faith in God day to day allows you to do? Those things in the world that spiritually are perversions. Those things in the world that wound you. Those things in the world that try to attack your faith in God, but yet you hold strong to it. You know what that belief truly is? That there's a God in heaven who sees all, knows all, knew it all before it was going to happen, and God allowed it to happen to you. But by faith you also understand that God did not call you to judge. All judgment has been committed unto Christ according to the Bible. You know who has the right to judge? The one who paid the price for all a man's sin. We were called to be servants. Your patience is that one day he's coming. By faith you believe he will come. And by faith you believe that when the time is right, he will mete out judgment unto every man. Not just to every man, but all manner of spiritual beings that fell with Lucifer. The very world itself will be judged for sin because sin cursed it. Your faith and your patience is that God's timing is right. That he does all things well. That although it may seem that he has allowed something that is unjust and something that is perverse or something that we would say doesn't need to happen, that God has a purpose for allowing it to happen. But just again, a reminder. God told the Apostle John to write down, remind them. Tell everybody. If they've got an ear, let them hear. Remind them that even though we're talking about literally hell on earth in these chapters, where God for seven years of man's time will allow Satan to have his way with not only the world, but with the men and women left on the world. It does not mean that God still isn't in control. God foretold that it would happen. We know from the Old Testament that the reason it is to happen is to purify His people. But out of it, even those that aren't of His chosen people still can find grace in such a time as this. If God sent judgment too early, some of them people wouldn't get in. If God truly judged as God is entitled to judge any second of any day since the beginning of time, you and I wouldn't be here. We never would have made it the year. 
Our patience is that we suffer long because our God is long-suffering. Our patience is that He does not only all things well, but He also causes all things to work for the good of them that love Him, that serve Him, that walk after Him. Our patience is that this life, we were called to, what, labor. Why? For the joy that is set before us, as Christ endured the suffering of the cross for the joy that was set before Him. And what is our faith that helps us be patient? That God hadn't broke one promise yet. I just believe He's not going to break any of the other ones. And right here in the middle, because we've been taking it week by week, but if you can imagine sitting down and reading all the letter at once, it'd be real easy to get disheartened at what's coming. You remember when the Apostle John said that he ate the book, it was sweet in his mouth, but bitter to his belly? At the beginning, you'd be real happy, hey, the Lord's coming back. But once you see all that will unfold, it'd be real easy to get disheartened by the time you get to the middle of chapter number 13. But God just puts a reminder in there. He's still got it all in control. Even though the Lord has allowed the devil to have free reign, he still can't do anything that God doesn't will. Even when the Holy Ghost is gone. Everything that happens during the end times, God still has to sign off on it. And He doesn't allow anything to happen except for what? His purpose, His will. So then we get to verse number 11. He says, And I beheld another beast. Where'd this one come from? Well, the first one came, if you'll remember, out of the sea. This one says it came up out of the earth. So as the Antichrist came out of literally nowhere, couldn't find him, couldn't figure out who he was, is in the bottomless deeps. Right? He came out of somewhere that you couldn't go and search for. Where does this beast come from? From right among the people. From the earth. Or men live, breathe, walk, have their course of everyday life. The origin of both of these beasts shows that the devil's always got something somewhere ready to use against you. Where do you send the Antichrist from? A place that you couldn't have found him even if you looked. Where's the prophet come from? The second beast. He came from right among you. He was there the whole time, but you never perceived it. That came up out of the earth. And he had two horns like a lamb, and he spake as a dragon. Again, why is he a prophet? Because he foretells things that are going to happen. We'll get to that here in a minute. But his visage is like a lamb with two horns. There's a contradiction there. Lambs don't have horns. Lambs is babies. You know what has horns? Rams. You know what that is? That's a grown male. Sheep. In order to have horns, he's got to be seasoned. He's something old, but he's made himself to look young, vulnerable, as if he's no threat to you. But yet the proof is in his very forehead, which is what? That he can do a lot of damage. I know about you, I don't want to get a headbutting contest with a ram today. I'm going to lose. Well, it says that he had two horns like a lamp, and he spake as a dragon. Again, haven't you heard our pastor say that looks can be deceiving? It's not the serpent, as we've already talked about, more subtle than anything. Is he not a master of lies because he's the father of it? Well, see, it looks real innocent, but it's got weapons. And then on top of that, when he opens his mouth, it doesn't sound like a sheep. It doesn't even sound like a baby sheep. It's not saying, bah, what's it sound like? It sounds like something that wants to eat you. It has the voice of a dragon. Why? Because... You can fool man. We know that God looks on the heart. But even on your best day, if you've 
got your act together and you look right, what's in your heart makes its way out your mouth. The way that you walk, the way that you conduct business, that speaks to who you really are. How much wool does this sheep have? Just enough to pull it over the eyes of the people that he's going to be deceiving. Well, verse number 12, he exercises all the power of the first beast before him. What's that mean? All of his power was given to him by who? The dragon. That's why he sounds like him. I don't hear it, but some people say, used to, I'd answer the phone at the house back when there was still a landline. And I'd answer the phone and I'd say, oh, hey, Doug. Nope, let me go get him. I didn't think that I sounded like him. People on the phone thought I did. But I can't help it. Just who I came from. But didn't Christ say that out of, but didn't Christ teach that the new creature, the new man, but if he put that fountain in you and you drank of it, It'd be springing up unto what eternal life. Then we're taught that the new creature takes on the attributes of whom? The father that birthed it. You know why sometimes people walk into stores and they look at you and they say, you're a Christian, aren't you? Because you talk like one. You sound like one. You live like one. You are truly a written epistle before. Well, this one looks like a lamb, but it's not. Just like the one that gave him power. So he sounds like him. He looks innocent, but when he opens his mouth, what comes out? The lies of hell. The lies of the devil. Then it says, He had all the power of the first beast, and causeth the earth and them which dwell therein to worship the first beast. You know what this guy's job is? He's the hype man. Right? You guys see him? You don't know how good he is. The whole world, we saw before this marveled at the first beast they was intrigued by it but just like anything some of y'all have a lot of things that you'd like to say to the president if you walked in the door today but a lot of you if the president really walked in the door today you'd be too awestruck to even open your mouth what's he doing here you wouldn't be able to get over it and everything that you want to say you wouldn't end up saying the same will be true with the first beast, the Antichrist. People will think, man, that guy's awesome. Right? You see it with celebrities all the time. Somebody goes up to ask for an autograph or for a photo, and by the time they get there, it's... <laughs> Can't even get the words out. Same will be true with... So, who's the second beast? He's the one that's going to be relatable, approachable. One that'll be able to tell others how great the first beast is so that they buy into the propaganda. He's the mouthpiece, if you will. While the first one is what? The muscle. The one that's going to bring war and destruction to all those that are against him. But this one's the politician. Getting everybody on the same side. It says, and... Cause the earth and them which dwell therein to worship the beast, whose deadly wound was healed. And he doeth great wonders. Who? The prophet. You know how great the beast is? The beast gave me the power to do this. And he'll do it. Make a fire come down out of heaven on the earth in the sight of men. What are all of these abilities angling towards? says and deceiveth them that dwell in the earth by the means of those miracles which he had power to do in the sight of the beast where does his power come from from the dragon but when does he do it when everybody's looking at the beast and will give him the credit for it he doesn't want credit he wants everybody to fall in line after the antichrist he is the mechanism by which the world will be deceived Okay, there are many things that may not be right, may not be holy, they're just weird, that if you'd see them while driving down the road, you'd turn your head and say, what in the world was that? That's going to be the Antichrist. Not a big talker. He's all about the walk instead of the talk. Well, who's the prophet? He's the one that's going to be hyping him up. 
Everybody's going to say, what in the world is that over there? You guys hear about that guy? The one that should have been dead, but he's not? Right, the one that seems to have answers to everybody's problems? Yeah, I've heard about him. What do you know about him? I don't know. Nobody knows. He don't talk to nobody. Then somebody's going to come in and say, I can tell you about him. Here's why you need to buy into him, because I did, and look what I can do. What's it say? It says he deceives the earth. Saying to them that dwell on the earth that they should make an image to the beast which had the wound by a sword and did live. Why is he called the prophet? Because by his way of deception, he will become, for all intents and purposes, the high priest of the devil. He institutes the one world religion. He convinces everybody. What you need is you need a picture of this guy. You need a photo, you need a painting, you need a graven image. Whatever it is, everybody needs to have a likeness of him so that they can bow down and worship him. Then verse number 15 it says, And he had power to give life unto the image of the beast. Now see, this is one that the devil may have always been able to do, but God hadn't allowed him to. Y'all remember when the Philistines took the Ark of the Covenant and they put it in the temple of their god Dagon, and twice they came in and Dagon was bowing down and worshiping the Ark of the Covenant, and then the next time they came in and his hands fell off and his head got knocked off of the statue? Has not God told Israel, mostly from the beginning, that He is the I Am, the Living One, Jehovah, that all their graven idols, they have ears which cannot hear, eyes that cannot see, mouths that cannot speak. Oh, verse number 15 it says, And he has the power to give life unto the image of the beast, that the image of the beast should both speak and cause that as many as would not worship the image of the beast should be killed. What's he doing? He's pulling a smoke and mirror show. For the first time, he says, yeah, all, the, all those idols of Buddha, all of those Indian statues, the thousands of gods that they have, you know, Shiva, the rest of them, Confucius, the Dalai Lama, all of these statues, okay, even the Virgin Mary, all the Catholic idolatry, all the things that some so-called Christians have in their house that, yeah, I'm not going to... Go back and listen to the old message. It's on YouTube. Casting out the graven image. It didn't just say don't carve an image of God. It said don't carve an image of anything in heaven, in the earth, or below the earth, in the sea. You know what that means? Nothing. Why? Because what your eyes are on, that's eventually what your heart's going to fall in love with. But here he says, hey, our images are different. Now, I understand that this is John. Around A.D. 100, give or take. Roughly about 60 years after the Lord's been received back up into heaven. Okay? We all on the same page? John had no idea that holograms were going to be a thing. He didn't know that word. Right, could you imagine trying to explain something other than Jesus in Jesus' day of what a Zoom call would be? Let alone a car? That might be a little bit easier. It's a chariot that runs without horses. Well, how's that happen? Magic. Right, imagine explaining the internet to somebody. Half of y'all couldn't even explain it. You just know you type something in and it shows up. Right, when it says the image, does it say graven image? No. It says that he caused them to do what? That they should make an image of the beast. You can do that with your own cell phone. They could have an app that once every day, what happens? Bells chime, and then all of a sudden, you see the beast talking to you in person. I don't believe that the God would allow the devil to do something that the devil's never been allowed to do before. 
We know he doesn't have new tricks. All of his tricks are the same. It's the same ones he's been using since the beginning. Didn't say that it was going to give life unto a statue. I've heard a lot of people preach that. Or life unto a photo. Just as it caused them to make an image. What could that image be? It could be holograms in every shopping center, every television network, every cell phone, everywhere you go. The beast, the first beast, always talking in your ear. You can't escape him. He's everywhere. And as a result of him being everywhere, what happens? People start believing what he's trying to get people to do. It says that as a, after right, this image starts speaking, that the image also says should both speak and cause that as many that don't worship the beast should die. He says the image of the beast which is made to speak also causes people to go out and do what? The persecution of the non-believers in the Antichrist. What's the prophet going to do? Y'all just need to download this new app. Y'all just need to tune in to our new news network. And little by little, what? Everybody's going to be enthralled. And as a result of what they hear the image speak, what happened? Their hearts are turned against those that aren't like-minded like them. In verse number 16, it says, And he causes all, both small and great, rich and poor, free and bond, to receive a mark in their right hand or in their forehead. The prophet's the one that gets everybody to buy in hook, line, and sinker. Why? Through this means of mass distribution of what the Antichrist is proposing. He's rallying the troops. He's the definition of a lieutenant. He receives his orders and he goes and he makes sure that other people follow. By any means necessary, you're going to get on board or what? You're going to get killed. And it's marked that they receive. We get its purpose in verse number 17. It says that no man might buy or sell, save that he had the mark or the name of the beast or the number of his name. Where? In their right hand or in their forehead. But if all technology is devoted to the beast and his campaign, so to speak, right, y'all remember in school when they showed you photos of Nazi Germany every building every doorway every room that you walked into what did you see you either saw that eagle on a flag or you saw the Nazi swastika it wasn't just something that some people bought everybody bought in hook line and sinker now it, you know it, it in the 50s and 60s, there were some people that said, oh no, we didn't know what we were doing. Everybody else nowadays, when they're getting old and they're about dead, they start telling you the truth. And they're like, oh yeah. He was a good speaker. We liked what he was saying. He was saying it wasn't our fault and it was somebody else's fault. So we went along with it. Because it made things better for us. It blamed everybody else for all the problems we were experiencing right now. And he claimed to have a solution for it. It's called payback. Well, he's going to go kick them like they kicked us in the first war. And for a time, it looked like they was going to win. What's it going to look like? It's going to look like the Antichrist is going to win. And everybody's going to be on what? The bandwagon. Well, there's a price for admission. Remember, you've got to give part of yourself to him to show that you're devoted. And I'm sure it won't be much. It'll probably be a whole lot easier than getting a vaccine. Or a whole lot easier than going and getting one of them new touch credit cards. It's real easy, whichever one you want. You can get it here or you can get it here. But it's just real simple. We've even got three designs you can choose from. What are you saying? You can get his logo. You can get his name, or you can get his 
basically a social security number. But it's the same. I'm with him. It's an identification that says I'm part of that crowd. Again, sound familiar? Even the hippies, when they go and they do one of them peace rallies, they all got the same button on. Well, to do it identifies them as part of the crowd. We're with them. We don't want to hurt nobody, man. Well, that may be true, but y'all still got buttons on that say y'all the same crowd. Y'all the same stripe. You believe and think the same way. Right, but this one, it's not as easy as something you can take off. What you got to do, it becomes a part of you. Can't escape it. Because right, once you've got it, what to give you? Access. To what? The in crowd. You want to buy something? No problem. Just wave the, wave the symbol. Let it scan your wrist or your forehead. Y'all remember all them machines when you used to walk into buildings and they had to stand there where it had your face and it would take your temperature? It's real easy to put an RFID reader in one of them things and just scan a chip that's in your forehead. Saying, Brother Jordan, you're paranoid. I don't know how long it's going to be. It may be a whole lot easier than that. You may have a little James Bond watch where you just go, mm, yep, he's one of them. I'd say, that's crazy. There's things that the military's developed that you got no idea about. I'd give some of y'all nightmares if you heard about some of the DARPA projects that got shot down and they're not funding anymore. What does that mean? They found something better to put the money towards. You want to go get, see your doctor? Got to, got to wave the hand. Got to get the forehead scan. You want to go to the grocery store? Want to buy gas? You want to pay your taxes? You want to go vote? Although I doubt there's going to be much voting. You want to drive down the interstate that our money paid for? We got to scan, scan your hand when you get in the car. Wouldn't surprise me. Be like one of them breathalyzer machines they put in a drunk's car when he gets arrested for DUI. Blow into this and then the car will start. Scan your hand and the car will start. You want to log in to use the internet? Give us the code of whatever the thing is in your hand. Or with your phones nowadays, take your phone, scan your hand. Okay, now it works. He's saying everything will be dictated by it. You say, that's weird, Brother Jordan. Yeah, don't you remember when it was weird to pay for things with a piece of plastic? And they had the little thing, the choo choo, and then you got the carbon copy paper of it? And then you would maybe get the bill like three months later because of the mail. Right, but you still got to walk out with it? That's weird. Yeah, it is weird. Except nowadays, everybody's just used to it. Y'all remember when it was weird to wear a mask in public? That got real normal real quick for a lot of people. Y'all remember when it was weird, right, for people up here to order sweet tea at a restaurant? Now everybody got it. They say, how you know, Brother Jordan? Because I used to go to a whole lot of places. I had to put sugar in it myself. We was Yankees back then. Okay, now we're part of the South. We got sweet tea. He's saying, people will accept something in the blink of an eye and get used to it real quick. Y'all remember how angry people got when they took the headphone jack off of the iPhones? Now they don't care no more. The funniest part about that was when the people on the internet said, oh no, it's still there, you just got to drill a hole in your phone. And people actually did it. Or the people that said, hey, the new iPhone, it's got a feature, you can throw it in your microwave and in 30 seconds it'll charge it. And people actually did it. Or they told them in the latest update, right, somehow Apple came out with this computer code that makes the phone waterproof that wasn't waterproof before. And people tried it. Saying, what are you saying, Brother Jordan? If you see it on the internet, it's real. Well, where's his face going to be? Everywhere. And what are they going to believe? What they see and what they hear. 
Why are they going to want to believe it? Because, or why are they going to believe it? Because they want to. It'll be the easiest option, the most convenient option. Hey, people that used to hate us, now they're our friends. Why? Because of that guy. Let's all sit in a drum circle and sing Kumbaya. That's not how it's going to be. For a little while it will be. Then it says, Here in his wisdom, let him that hath understanding count the number of the beast, for it is the number of a man. Then the number is six hundred, three score, and six. But six, six, six. Part of that, again, I've already told you, the Antichrist isn't going to be the Pope. Why? Because he's coming out of nowhere. It's not going to be somebody that you'd expect. But people say, you take all the Roman numerals off of the Pope's three crowns that he has on his head, what's it comes out to? Six, six, six. Right? It's subliminal. Those things, you got to have a conspiracy theorist and you got to like go out and bake in the sun in the desert for a few days before it starts making sense. It was the aliens, man. No, it wasn't. You got hit in the head with a shiny frisbee and then you thought it was an alien when you woke up. Right? Or you went out and you was drinking with your buddies in the woods and when you passed out and your wife was angry when you got home, it was aliens, man. I promise, it wasn't me. It's also a thing called mass hysteria where people believe they actually saw something when they didn't. What are you saying, Brother Jordan? I'm saying there's a lot of people trying to connect that number with something that we see now. You know when that number is going to be important? When the one who starts using it shows up. Okay, hate to say this, but I got my W-2. Right on total amount earned this year, 666. And I'm like, fantastic. Right, right before the dot and then after the comma. And I'm like, you couldn't have given me one more minute of overtime or something? Take a minute away. I mean, it just looks weird. But you know what I find interesting about that verse? Here in his wisdom. What is wisdom? Understanding. He says, I'm going to tell you what the number's going to be. People that have never opened a Bible in their life know that the number 666 has evil connotation. You know why that is? Because people have been telling other people about this verse. What's the requirement that you can be saved during the Great Tribulation? You have to have never heard the gospel. There's people all over this world that know nothing about Jesus, but they know that number 666 is evil. You don't think that's the divine grace of God? That even though maybe a missionary never came by their way, or maybe their country was closed to missionaries, you know something that does make its way across borders? Pop culture. Pop culture can cross the border, and when people hear, ah, I don't, I know that's not good. You say it's good, I've heard it's not good. But, the number six, well, it says that the number of the beast is the number of them. It's not something that you can't understand. It's a number that man already has. Isn't that just like the devil takes something that man made and then use it for their detriment? But, it says, for it is the number of a man. Well, you study out things in the Bible. Number six comes up a lot. What's the number of the beast? It's six three times. How many days did God create everything? Six. And he rested on the Sabbath. That seventh day was a reminder for man that if God can get it all done in six days, you can get everything done in your week done in six days, and then you give the seventh and keep it holy to God. Why is six the number of a man? Because man thinks he can get everything done in six days and worship himself. He doesn't need the seven. What's the number of God? Well, there's three, the Trinity. What's twice three? Six. Hadn't man always been taking what God says and trying to add to it? 
They've got their own method. Why, ours is twice as good because it's twice as much. But what's it do? It condemns you to the life of the beast and his rule and reign. But it's just the number of a man. There's no significance or power in it. It's just the number that the Antichrist will pick and God, through foreknowledge, says, take note of this number because it's going to be important one day. That's how you'll know not to take it because that's his. You'll be able to know who he is what if you're looking, if you're really paying attention to what's between the lines. If instead of listening to what you hear, think about what he doesn't want you to hear. Did you know that you could receive a daily devotion every morning in your inbox? Head on over to ibcflorence.com and click on Daily Devotions to sign up today. And as always, thanks for listening.